While many of Baz Luhrmann's films are well regarded by the common moviegoer, the Australian auteur is often criticized by more serious cinephiles. In fact, when his latest film Elvis was released in theaters, a lot of the online discourse pointed out his quote-unquote flaws. He's style over substance. He lacks heart. He's too flashy. Too indulgent, I would read. As a longtime admirer of his work, I found many of these criticisms pretty unfair. Sure, he's an extreme maximalist, but he's also a great storyteller, whose madness always results into unforgettable theatrical experiences. Whether you like his work or not, it's hard to deny that he is a unique cinematic voice who produces distinctive work that is entirely his own. You simply know when you're watching a Baz Luhrmann picture. In this video essay, I'll be examining the different facets of Baz Luhrmann's cinema, his daring vision as a modern-day auteur, the common themes and stylistic choices within his films, his incredible use of music, and finally, how he brings his productions to life, particularly his artistic partnership with wife Catherine Martin. Hopefully, this video will help you appreciate the filmmaker for what he is, an absolute original. Before I jump into what makes a Baz Luhrmann picture a Baz Luhrmann picture, it's important to know a little bit about his background and how he became a filmmaker. Mark Anthony Luhrmann was born in 1962 to Leonard Luhrmann and Barbara Carmel. Although born in Sydney, he spent his early childhood years at Herons Creek, a small outback town north of New South Wales where his family operated several small businesses including a farm and petrol station. His father also ran the local movie theater which allowed young Mark to see many films for free. When his parents divorced, Lerman elected to stay with his father, but soon followed his mother and brothers to Sydney to get away from his new stepmom. While at the big city, Barbara became a ballroom dance instructor, introducing her young son to the performing arts. Lerman learned the art of dance during his formative teenage years. In Sydney, Baz embraced his love for the arts, finding activities in theater, music, and opera. This is the period when he adapted the name Baz, a nickname given to him by other students in reference to a bushy-tailed fox puppet from a popular local TV show. After being rejected from the National Institute of Dramatic Arts, which I'll refer to as Nita from this point onward, he appeared as a pimp in the 1981 film Winter of Our Dreams across Judy Davis. Lerman also worked at the Australian Opera Company in a mission to help them connect with younger audiences. At age 20, he was finally accepted into Nita, where he studied acting. During his time at school, Lerman developed a 30-minute play called Strictly Ballroom, which told the story of a young dancer named Scott Hastings who disrupts the world of competitive ballroom dancing by doing his own steps. In the process, he forms an unlikely romance with his oddball dance partner, Fran. After successfully showing the production at a youth drama festival in Czechoslovakia, Lerman brought the play to Sydney's Wharf Theatre in 1988 where it was seen by Australian music executive Ted Albert. Albert expressed his interest in making the play into a feature film. Lerman agreed, under the condition that he directed himself. The film version of Strictly Ballroom was screened at the Cannes Film Festival in 1992, where it was greeted with a 15-minute standing ovation. Not since Crocodile Dundee has an Australian film infatuated the marketplace to the Strictly Ballroom degree, wrote Ruth Hesse from the Cannes Film Festival in an article for Rolling Stone Australia. Even the success of last year's surprise Australian hit Proof didn't translate into sales. By the end of the week, the film has sold to every major film distributor in the world. People have been moved to clap, cheer, and stomp their feet during screenings of Strictly Ballroom all over the world, in Melbourne, in Paris, and London, as well as Cannes. Not bad for a low-budget arthouse film about ballroom dancing. Not bad for a first-time director who grew up thinking he was a dag. 
Strictly Ballroom was one of the festival's biggest hits, going on to win a special award. In addition, it would collect other accolades from other award-giving bodies, such as eight Australian Film Institute statues, including Best Film, two BAFTAs, and a Golden Globe nomination for Best Motion Picture, Musical, or Comedy. At only 30 years old, Baz Luhrmann had arrived. It wasn't long before Hollywood came knocking. Lerman followed up Strictly Ballroom with a reinterpretation of Romeo and Juliet in 1996, setting the story to the modern day but keeping the text's original Shakespearean language. It was a massive hit with the youth, propelling budding actor Leonardo DiCaprio into superstardom. Then came 2001's Moulin Rouge, which has been credited for reinvigorating the movie musical genre. The film was considered a cultural phenomenon, was a box office hit, and was nominated for eight Oscars, eventually winning two. In 2008, he released the critically panned Australia. While it is often considered his worst film, it still sold a lot of tickets. By 2013, Lerman released the widely popular The Great Gatsby, redefining Fitzgerald's classic tale of prohibition excess with a distinctive hip-hop soundtrack. His latest feature, released just this year, is a musical biopic about the life of Elvis Presley, with an incredible, Oscar-worthy performance from leading man Austin Butler. All of Baz Luhrmann's films have been box office successes. Apart from the small indie hit Strictly Ballroom, every one of his projects have grossed over $100 million. Even Australia, which is often considered a flop in terms of Luhrmann's box office power, still recuperated its budget by over $70 million. The Great Gatsby remains to be his most financially successful film yet, earning over $350 million worldwide. Elvis has already surpassed the $200 million mark, which is impressive, considering it's a drama made during the New World Order where comic book heroes and franchises are king. Fact is, Baz Luhrmann can get butts into theaters. Despite audiences loving his cinematic outputs, critics usually greet his films with mixed reviews, often citing his flamboyant style, campy acting, thin storylines, and kinetic pacing as too excessive. Still, it doesn't stop the auteur from making the kind of art that he wants to make. I'm used to mixed reviews. I get that all the time, he told ABC News Australia in an interview from 2013. From strictly ballroom to all the things I've ever made, I think it's because we work outside the box. Because I'm a particular language that I own, that's mine, and it offends some critics. Point is, the guys who mainly do criticism, they will be very serious about Iron Man, which is good because I love Iron Man, but they'll talk about Iron Man like it's Hamlet. With only six features to his name, Lerman isn't a very prolific filmmaker. However, it isn't without good reason. He takes his time researching and is very involved with every aspect of production. Apart from being the director, he also writes and produces his own movies and oversees everything, from the design aspect, music recordings, and even choreography. Lerman also keeps a very busy schedule outside of the movies. He constantly works on the stage, taking on plays, operas, and musicals, TV, fashion, and music. Even when he's not focused on cinema, Baz Luhrmann lives to be creative. The structure of Baz Luhrmann's stories is pretty much the same across his six feature films. The audience is first introduced to the story's narrator, who acts as our guide through an unknown world. Think of the British writer Christian, who finds himself in French Bohemia in Moulin Rouge, or the preppy Nick Carraway, who is exposed to Gatsby's excessive bootlegging lifestyle. They are the fish out of the water character, who is there to help the audience relate to the story. We are then thrusted into the film's first act, which is often very fast paced, frantic, and over the top. The beginning of Lerman's films are simply there to establish characters, settings, and motives through heightened storytelling. By the picture's second act, the narrative takes a major tonal shift. Things get darker as the stakes get higher for our heroes. While the first half of the picture pushes frenzied comedy to the edge, the second act brings intense melodrama front and center. For instance, Romeo and Juliet starts off as a wacky slapstick comedy but ends as a tragic romance complete with ugly crying. In the film Australia, 
a reserved English widow's cattle drive adventure turns into a deeply serious drama about the racism Aborigines face in the country. Lerman's storytelling is usually aided with electrifying visuals, frantic editing, a unique soundtrack, and glitzy movie stars who understand the assignment. He also uses countless filmic devices such as freeze frames, filters, news reports, artificiality, heightened colors, narrators, and superimposition. In short, it's cinema on steroids. Unlike many directors who find their voice only after making several pictures, Lerman's style has been very distinct since the beginning of his career. His first three films, Strictly Ballroom, Romeo and Juliet, and Moulin Rouge, were all made as part of what Lerman dubs the Red Curtain Trilogy. These pictures share many themes and stylistic choices. In countless interviews, Lerman explains the basic characteristics that tie the trilogy together. 1. The audience knows how it will end when it begins, that it's usually based on a recognizable myth. 2. That it is set in a heightened, created world. And 3. That there is some form of device, like singing or dancing, to keep the audience aware that they're watching a movie. While his succeeding films don't belong to this particular trilogy, all of these characteristics are evident throughout his entire body of work. Lerman calls this genre of filmmaking Red Curtain Cinema. Oh, red curtain, that's just a very simple way of referring to this theatricalized cinematic form. It's theatrical, it's an artificial language that one hopes, you know, a big lie that gets to a big truth. And you sort of see the history of that cinematic form in the, in the great Hollywood films of the 30s and the 40s, and that's everything from, you know, Top Hat to Citizen Kane. You see it alive in, in, in popular Asian cinema today, still in, in the movies of Bollywood, for example. The mechanics of it are there's a, there's a very simple underlying story or myth, a, a myth shape, that the audience recognize how the film is going to end when it begins. So you take that story shape and you set it in what we call a heightened creative world. You know, it's a, a, a world that is familiar but exotic. It's distant, so you can see the characters in it, you can see yourself in it, but it's familiar. You know, in the case of Strictly Ballroom, of course, it's the you know, world of ballroom dancing. And um, Romeo and Juliet, it's the postmodern world of Verona Beach. In Moulin Rouge, it's Montmartre, you know, Moulin Rouge, you know, Paris 1900. It's a distancing device. And then, then your third device is there's something throughout the film that constantly demands of the audience that they participate in the cinema, that they're always reminded they're watching a movie. There's no pretense whatsoever that it's naturalism, that you're watching reality through a keyhole. Using 2001's Moulin Rouge as the prime example, let's go through each of Lerman's three characteristics and see how the film fits into the mold of red curtain cinema. Author Annette Koch notes that red curtain cinema is certainly a genre that is opposed to classic Hollywood style and breaks with traditions and rules. The colorful sets, the modern music, and the fast-paced cutting are exaggerated and do not comply with reality as we know it. In red curtain cinema, the form, structure, and presentation of the story are more important than the narrative itself, which is the reason why the ending is always already revealed at the very start of the film. By giving away the tragic outcome in the beginning, the focus of the film moves away from the what to the how. What is of interest is not so much what happens in the film, but how it is presented. This allows Lerman to break free from conventional filmmaking rules and embrace his inner maximalist. Let's compare Moulin Rouge which he says embodies the best that Red Curtain Cinema has to offer, to another iconic love story, James Cameron's Titanic. For four hours, viewers are wondering if Jack and Rose will survive the ship sinking. We witness their adventure, their hardships, and their quest for survival. In the end, Jack dies and Rose survives. However, in Moulin Rouge, Lerman reveals Satine's death at the very start of the picture. Now that the audience knows his ending, he can focus on the journey instead. Satine and Christian's romance is equally as tragic as Jack and Rose's, but it is aided with crazy, acid-filled dream sequences, lush musical numbers, and explosive energy. It isn't realistic at all. I would argue that Titanic is more concerned with traditional narrative, while Moulin Rouge is more focused on unique storytelling. As for point two, in which his films need to be set in heightened created worlds, Moulin Rouge finds its setting in the infamous Montmartre nightclub during turn of the century Paris. In interviews, Lerman often says that his goal was to create the nightclub of your dreams. 
His version of the Moulin Rouge is obscenely excessive and probably too sexy for 1900 France. He makes this world his by giving it an exaggerated carnival-like feel, with the can-can dancers representing every sexual fetish men have. He also borrows elements from the opera La Bohème as well as the Greek tragedy of Orpheus to give this world a romantic depth. Finally, for his last point, the musical factor is obviously what helps the audience remember that they're watching cinema. For the film's score, Lerman cleverly incorporates contemporary pop songs of the MTV generation. He decided to do this so that the audience would be able to sing along with the songs even if they were watching the film for the first time. Examine any of Lerman's films and you'll be able to fit them into the mold of red curtain cinema. Here is one more quick example to get my point across. In The Great Gatsby, the audience already knows how the story will end because it opens with Nick Carraway at a mental institution after a dramatic event. There, he alludes to the demise of his friend Gatsby. The whole story is set in a heightened world, particularly the glamorous roaring 20s of F. Scott Fitzgerald's imagination. Finally, to help the audience reject realism, Lerman fills the soundtrack with modern-day hip-hop songs as a way to express the excess of this time period. Since he works within the rules of Red Curtain Cinema, I think it's very fair to call Baz Lerman a modern-day auteur. The Merriam-Webster Dictionary defines the term auteur theory very simply, a view of filmmaking in which the director is considered the primary creative force in a motion picture. If that isn't Baz Luhrmann, then I don't know what he is. I see music in life, actually, Baz Luhrmann said to writer Elsie M. Walker in 2000. I almost think that the very matter from which we are made is musical, and in terms of storytelling, that's what I do, it's my work and my life really, I see music as the great, great asset, a tool of it. But also, I think it's a force that bonds all humanity, so it was important to find musical language. It's no secret that the director loves music. Each of his films have a musical approach even when they aren't blatantly movie musicals. Lerman notes that it was during a life-changing trip to India which intrigued him with the genre. After seeing a Bollywood musical in cinemas, he was enthralled with how self-aware it was and how the audience participated with the musical numbers they saw on screen. Because of this, he decided to adapt the style for his own films. Lerman's movies often incorporate contemporary popular music into their narratives for two reasons. One, to make past times more accessible, and two, to convey his character's inner feelings. For instance, by using hip-hop in The Great Gatsby, the director hopes that today's audiences will be able to appreciate the Roaring Twenties through a modern lens. Lerman himself puts it best in a number of 2013 interviews. I can never know what Fitzgerald would think of what we've done with the film, but I've done it, I hope in a way, to help get the audience get a feeling of what jazz might have felt like in the 20s, dangerous, intoxicating, and thrilling. When people asked Fitzgerald why he was putting this African-American street music called jazz into his book, he told them that it was of the moment. Now though, it's not as dangerous as the other form of African-American music called hip-hop. So I added that, thinking that as long as I did the translation of the music, the world of that time would merge neatly with ours. 2022's Elvis is another great example of how Lerman uses modern music to connect the past to the present. While Elvis Presley himself was very radical when he first broke out in the 1950s, the director was having trouble conveying the same type of rebellious energy onto the silver screen. To fix it, he started incorporating tracks from artists like Doja Cat, Kanye West, Jack White, Gary Clark Jr., and Eminem to emphasize the type of swagger Elvis had during this typically reserved time period. It's electrifying an audience for the first time when he's starting to move, said Lerman in an interview with Entertainment Weekly. Yes, it's exciting, but the style of music makes it very hard for you to know what it felt like in context. It felt like they were watching a punk rock performance. That's how shocking it was. That's why, all of a sudden, Gary Clark Jr. starts shredding his guitar really heavily because you go, wow, it must have been electric. Let's also explore how the auteur reveals his character's inner thoughts through music by looking closely at the soundtrack of Romeo and Juliet. 
Lerman says that every single song on the album is there to serve the story. For instance, Nelly Hopper's hip-hop track, The Montague Boys, which was written specifically for the film, plays as we're first introduced to the gang. It is clearly there for a reason. Not only does it establish these famous characters, but also reminds viewers that we're watching a 90s interpretation of this classic tragedy. Later on, Prince's When Doves Fly is sung by an all-boys choir as Romeo first meets with the friar. While you can brush this song choice off as mere novelty, there is actually a deeper meaning to it. Doves symbolically represents peace and love. As the friar listens to Romeo reveal his newfound love for his enemy's daughter, he sees the union as a way of ending the war between the Montagues and the Capulets. One final example is when the Cardigans pop song Love Fool plays in the film. While it is only heard for a few seconds, Lerman says that the repeated lyric of Love Me, Love Me captures Juliet's feelings towards Romeo. Therefore, he thinks of it as her theme song. In a 2006 conversation with writer Harvey Kubernick, Lerman reveals his logic as to why it's acceptable to use new songs in old settings, stating that it is an old Hollywood practice. It's a very old idea in musicals, like when Judy Garland sings Clang 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 with the Trolley in Meet Me in St. Louis. That's set in 1900, and she is singing big band music from the 1940s, the music of her time, to let you into the characters of another time and another place. The other thing is that, in an old musical, the audience had a relationship to the music generally before they went in, whether it was a Broadway show or with songs that move from film to film. So the audience having a pre-existing relationship to at least some of the music is very important. And honestly, that makes a lot of sense to me. Look, I watch a lot of films, especially musicals from the 50s and 40s, and they pretty much do the same thing Lerman is doing today. Lerman's soundtracks have found great success with mainstream music lovers. The official albums of Romeo and Juliet, Moulin Rouge, and The Great Gatsby are all certified platinum many times over and are considered some of the best-selling movie soundtracks of all time. It's amazing that even with a proven track record, Lerman says that incorporating popular songs have always been an uphill battle for him. In one interview that I read, the director says how record labels, studios, and some artists have continued to doubt his vision. Thankfully, he fights to get his way. Because of his uncompromising attitude and belief in what he does as an artist, audiences have been treated to spectacular sensory experiences for decades. Who would have thought that using Cyndi Lauper's time after time in a ballroom dancing movie would be so brilliant? Or that the police's Roxanne would be a sensual, heartbreaking tango? Or that Jay-Z's No Church in the Wild would perfectly capture the unrest of Prohibition New York? Or that Radiohead would be the best band to emphasize teenage angst and heartbreak? The answer, Baz Luhrmann did. And thank the movie gods for that. Baz Luhrmann is the first to admit that he wouldn't be where he is without the help of a strong pool of Australian artists who have been instrumental in bringing his vision to life. For instance, without editor Jill Billcock, the signature kinetic editing of Luhrmann's movies, first established in the Red Curtain trilogy, would not exist today. Names like choreographer John Chacha O'Connell, screenwriter Craig Pierce, composer Craig Armstrong, and cinematographer Donald McAlphin are familiar names in Baz Luhrmann's filmography. The director calls this group of creatives the House of Iona, primarily because they worked out of Lerman's Iona estate, a Victorian mansion located in the inner city suburb of Darlinghurst, Sydney. In the Moulin Rouge Blu-ray, Lerman gives a small tour of the property, where many of his films were conceived and born. There are rooms for every specialized department where artists are able to play and create with his guidance. Even as actors were asked to live on the property during pre-production where they would undergo extensive training such as recording sessions, dance practice, and acting workshops to help them prepare for their roles. In 2016, Lerman sold the mansion to look for a more family-friendly place. But even without the estate, the bohemian lifestyle that the House of Iona promoted did not fade away. His band of contributors continue to work closely with the director in Australia where he opts to produce all his pictures under the Bazmark production company. While the contributions of these artists are all remarkable, there is one that I'd like to focus on today. 
Catherine Martin, who is the costume and production designer of all his movies. Although Lerman has replaced people over the years, Martin remains to be his most consistent artistic partner. Lerman first discovered Catherine Martin, whom he endearingly calls CM, in 1986 as a third-year design student at NIDA. He soon asked her to join his opera and theater companies where she worked on his opera Lake Lost. He had two stage managers pushing this rowboat on wheels with two of the lead players inside, she shared with The New Yorker in 2002. I just remember thinking that this man was a fucking genius. It was so beautifully artificial. From this point onward, CM was a permanent fixture at the house of Iona, bringing the director's imaginings into material form. They would later marry. CM began her film career as the production designer on both Strictly Ballroom and Romeo and Juliet before graduating to head both design departments for all of Baz's subsequent pictures. Because of her glorious work, Martin has won four Academy Awards under her husband's direction, making her the most awarded Australian in Oscar history. Today, Martin co-manages Bazmark, giving her producing credits on the films as well. Lerman often emphasizes that his partnership with Martin is the most important in his artistic career. I see my job as translating Baz's vision, Martin told Christina Karras in a 2002 interview for The Design Files. He is a very visual director and will always start the process with visual cues, whether it is little scribbles, tear sheets, or inspiration photos. And it's my job to visually synthesize and translate his vision into reality. It's about taking something like a thought, an idea, or something he described to me verbally into concrete things, a piece of fabric on an actor's back, or a piece of furniture in Elvis's international suite. Today, the name Catherine Martin is pretty much synonymous to prestige filmmaking. Whenever she's doing a project, she's almost certainly in contention for awards before the film is even seen by critics and audiences. Martin is an awards magnet, even when her husband is not. If you look at her work closely, you'll see exactly why she is held in such high esteem. One simply doesn't walk away from pictures like Moulin Rouge or The Great Gatsby or Elvis without thinking of the intricately designed world in which the stories are set. There are countless of articles online in which Lerman and Martin talk about their process together, but after going through many of them, I realized it was hard to pinpoint anything academic about it. My conclusion is, they are comparable to lightning in a bottle, a perfect artistic partnership who found each other during the perfect time in history. Baz Luhrmann may be the vision, but Catherine Martin is the world builder. Together they are a force to be reckoned with. I'll close this chapter by leaving you with an interesting excerpt from an article by Vogue Australia's Natasha Inchley, who tries her best to capture Lerman and Martin's artistic process. Indeed, there is a magic to Lerman and Martin's art. Together, they conjure this exceptional visual style, and the ultimate effect is so freeing and exuberant, yet such rigor and discipline goes into the process. I see things in pictures, and I always have, says Lerman. I start with an idea, a lot of collages, and very quickly, CM and I get into these philosophical discussions, which in turn begins the research. We are almost like detectives. The thinking is so intense and deep, we live in it. It's interesting to drill down on their formula. If the mood that Lerman creates is designed to conjure a kind of hyper-cinematic experience, the stylized sets, the emotional thump of the music, the whooshing scenes, then Martin's costumes are flawlessly precise. Her goal, she says, is to capture a certain lightness. The costume designer thinks deeply about every aspect of a character's wardrobe, right down to the pajamas she imagines them wearing to bed. The common theme that runs through Baz Luhrmann's films is forbidden love. Scott Hastings and Fran cannot dance together in Strictly Ballroom because he is considered much more talented than she is. The very idea that the prince of the ballroom could fall in love with Little Miss Nobody was a big issue in the story. The romance between Romeo and Juliet is impossible because of their family's deep hatred for one another. Satine and Christian are doomed from the very beginning because a prostitute cannot fall in love with anybody, especially a penniless writer. Australia has two examples forbidden love. 
the first being the upper-class Lady Sarah Ashley and the cattleman Drover whose idea of a perfect life causes friction in their relationship, the second being with the aboriginal boy Nula whose skin color is deemed unlovable by the laws of the time. Daisy and Gatsby are divided by their social classes. Even when Gatsby becomes a millionaire, Daisy still chooses to stay with her aristocrat husband. And finally, Elvis takes the form of the forbidden fruit altogether, especially when lens through the eyes of Colonel Tom Parker. In some ways, I find the idea of loving Baz Luhrmann so appealing because he is my forbidden fruit. I can't tell you how many times other cinephiles have shrugged when I brought Baz Luhrmann into the conversation. Does it make me any less of a serious cinephile for loving a filmmaker not universally accepted as a genius? I don't think so. You can love David Lynch and Baz Luhrmann at the same time. I know because I do. Cinema is there for anybody who can relate to it. It doesn't matter if it's a deeply philosophical film about a woman's struggle with depression or a flamboyant jukebox musical with songs sang atop a 70-foot elephant. If it touches your soul, then embrace it. And for the record, I think Lerman is a genius. I embrace Baz Luhrmann for everything he is and everything he isn't. I love how imperfect his films are. I love how watching his movies make me feel as if I'm on an acid trip. I love how he uses modern music to give bygone generations new life. I love how he directs his actors to borderline camp performances that suddenly take a dark turn halfway through his pictures. I love how he expertly navigates tonal shifts and completely gets away with it. I love how he sees beauty in everything. I love how he wants his audience to reject realism and embrace the artificiality of cinema. Sure, he'll always have his haters, but in me, he'll always have a fan. I hope that after watching this video essay, you've learned a little bit about him, his artistry, and his directorial decisions. Perhaps you'll see his films in a whole new light. And as a Baz Luhrmann stan, I could ask for nothing less.